Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, last count, we were about 135 registered. Uh, so that's really perfect. I think it underscores the interest and momentum in the issue of carbon capture. Um, my name is Brad Crabtree. I work for the Great Plains Institute, and I staff uh, what's called the Carbon Capture Coalition, which is a coalition of over 60 uh, energy, industrial, and technology companies, labor unions, environmental, clean energy, and agricultural NGOs that are all working together to support federal policy to advance carbon capture. Um, we're pleased to host this uh, series of briefings with two other partner organizations. Um, many of you know about the Carbon Utilization Research Council. Uh, it's an organization that's dedicated to advancing technology solutions for the responsible use of fossil energy. Uh, Kirk played a very significant role in advancing the 45Q tax credit that passed last year uh, on a bipartisan basis in Congress. Uh, my colleague uh, Shannon Angelski is here. She just arrived. Hello, Shannon. Good morning. Um, also, Mike Weiner from Kirk is here. Uh, morning, Mike. Uh, also, the other partner, the Global Carbon Capture and Storage Institute, uh, is an international think tank. Uh, members include governments, companies, NGOs. Uh, originally, it was founded by the Australian government as a global presence. Uh, GCSI is dedicated to accelerating the deployment of carbon capture as part of a broader strategy of re uh, reaching zero carbon emissions by mid-century. My colleague Lee Beck is here, has played a huge role in helping to organize this and the previous sessions. Also, Jeff Erickson is in the back. Welcome, Jeff. Um, so, really thanks to both organizations. They're great partners. We also have uh, supporting organizations that are involved in these programs. <coughs> I want to recognize them. Uh, the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, Clean Air Task Force, Clear Path, Third Wave, the Bipartisan Policy Center, Citizens for Responsible Energy, and the Great Plains Institute, where I work. Uh, finally, I want to thank Cam Nelson and Senator Manchin staff for arranging this room for us. I uh, very much appreciate their ongoing support for this briefing series. <laughs> The purpose of this briefing series is to provide congressional staff with an opportunity to learn more about carbon capture. Uh, we had well over 200 attendees for each of the first two briefings. Um, and uh, so it's just great, as I said, to see this continuing interest. Uh, this session will focus, the, the first two briefings, the first focused on the essential role that carbon capture needs to play in meeting mid-century climate goals. Uh, the second briefing shifted to technology and the many technologies available to capture and manage CO2 from industrial sources and from power plants. And this is focused on carbon storage and utilization as well as direct air capture. So first the critical role of climate, then how do we capture the CO2 and carbon and manage it, and now what, where do we put it and how do we put it to productive use. Before we get started, I'd just like to uh, mention one thing. Uh, for those of you who are checking in, we didn't have perhaps enough copies. I hope we did. Uh, you had there a federal policy blueprint. Uh, this is a document that was just released last week. It was uh, it's, uh, the consensus. It's a consensus federal blueprint for federal policy from the Carbon Capture Coalition. The coalition spent five months working on it. And the goal is now that 45Q is passed and we have this really important incentive, what are the other federal policies that are needed to, to enhance 45Q and to build on 45Q? The, the larger ambition is that, is that carbon capture have the same breadth and level of policy support that other low and zero carbon technologies have, such as wind and solar, and that we can have the same type of deployment occur that we've seen for those other technologies. Um, so I encourage you to look at this resource, the fact that, again, that we have over 60 companies, unions, and NGOs backing this agenda is quite significant. Also want to note, if you did get a copy of this, uh, you will get an electronic version by email after the event. Also, you will have the, uh, the, the PowerPoint presentations available electronically uh, and the recording of the meeting, both for your own use and if you wish to share it with others. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Shannon, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Shannon.
Thanks, Brad, for, for that great introduction. And um, I'm very excited to introduce my friend Allison. Um, before I do that, I just want to call out my um, Kirk member that's also going to be presenting today, Sally Greenberg. She's going to talk to you about geologic storage, but this is going to be a fantastic session with Deepika and, and Allison and Jesse um, participating. So thank you for doing that. Um, I want to uh, introduce our keynote speaker, Allison Anderson. Some of you may know Allison, um, and maybe not, but I'm going to just connect a couple of dots for you about Allison before she comes up. Um, she's right now the executive director of the American Geosciences Institute. She is a geologist by training, so she is perfect for this discussion. Um, and prior to that, she worked with um, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. Um, and that was following the Water Horizon Corps. So, perfect time to be there, very interesting time. And she is certainly a, a pioneer in the industry, sort of paving the way for, for all of us. And this is an important talk that we're thrilled to have you here, Allison. Um, what I wanted to, to mention is that I know Allison for many years ago when she worked with Senator Jeff Bateman when he was chairman of the uh, Energy Committee, Senate Energy uh, Committee, I should say. And she was one of the um, first staffers that I had the opportunity to work with that knew geology, knew everything that was below the ground, and tried to help us understand how do we intersect these policy impacts of, of what we're trying to do with carbon capture and utilization and storage in the subsurface. And so she was like such a resource to all of us that we're just learning, we were just really trying to scratch the surface on some of these issues at the time. So um, she is really key to a lot of the initial policies that we have currently in place today um, because of, of her work on the committee and her education to all of us that, that really, we really needed uh, her help. And so, so timely, so glad that you made it to Washington uh, and found your way here. So with that introduction, I'm just going to hand it straight over to you, Allison, and that you take over from here. But thank you. <laughs> That was like one of the nicest introductions I had in, in like ever. Uh, but Shannon's right, we were together, uh, I started on the Hill in about 2006, and, it, and I actually don't like standing behind a podium, so I'm going to try to step out and see if it works, but if not, you guys tell me you can't hear me, and I'm going to walk back. So can you guys hear me? In the back. Nod? Thank you. Okay, so podiums are stifling and they're not great. And neither is PowerPoint, so you're not going to see that here today. I'm just going to talk for a little bit. I've only got about five or six minutes to kind of give you a framing um, uh, overview of all of this. So the concept, as Shan was alluding to, of geologic sequestration actually has been around in the vernacular for decades, right? But uh, doing things in the ground is challenging, okay? And so when, when I used to work up here, people would say, Allison, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a geologist. And they'd say, oh, you study genealogy. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I don't actually know my own ancestry. So when 23andMe came along, I did, finally, and I could answer that question. But, um, but, but geology, I would always sum it up as, I study the things that go in and out of the ground from a policy perspective, okay? So, so I'm going to give a public service announcement. There are many of us on the Hill, we're hidden places, so that we are a resource to you. The Congressional Research Service has geologists on hand. <coughs> Uh, there's actually an American Geosciences Institute fellow currently in Senator Whitehouse's office. He's also, he might be in here and I'm not seeing him. Uh, he'll, he'll remain anonymous if he wants to. Um, he's actually a carbon sequestration expert. So that is a resource for you as well. So, so the American Geosciences Institute is the reason why I was able to come to the Hill and work on policy like CCS. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a petroleum geologist, so I view the subsurface from that lens. And most all of what we're doing in the subsurface related to uh, carbon sequestration uh, comes from the oil field up front. Okay, so you're going to hear a lot of that from Sally, because she can, yay, she's in the back there, and she's delightful. We've worked together for just as long, because we are all in the same sort of um, class that was figuring this out from a policy perspective. So really, this kind of policy only really came about in 2007 with the Energy Independent Security Act. Okay, so if you need to go back and see what policy is out there, I would encourage you to visit that, and certainly Shannon can point you to it when she visits with you guys later. Okay, so, so I, want, I want to highlight a few things. First of all, um, we've learned already that geology is not genealogy, that's excellent. So if you learn nothing else, you'll know that we don't study ancestry. But we do study the ancestry of the Earth, so think about it that way, okay? Anything that you think about from a policy perspective in, in terms of what we're going to put in or out of the ground, 
Remember, the odds of it staying there for the entire life cycle of the Earth is pretty slim. So the term permanence is very important. So, so, so use that term very carefully. So that's a thing that people get wrapped around in the policy setting, is what does permanence mean, okay? Just put that in the back of your head, and if you want to talk to me about it later, we can talk about that. Different policy efforts to make sequestration permanent have often failed because we can't agree to that term, all right? But the Earth is a dynamic system. How many people in here have taken an Earth science class in their life? Raise your hand. That's actually amazing. <laughs> okay, that's amazing. Did you have it in junior high school? How many people had it in high school? Okay, college. That is even more amazing. Okay, this is actually a much more educated audience than I used to. I can go and speak actually at some conferences with a lot of energy experts, and there'll be like one person that raises their hand. So this helps me skip forward, and Sally's been really enjoyed talking to them because you already have a good background. Okay, so a couple things to consider. The, the need to do something on CO2 is there. You, you guys don't need a primer because you guys came to the first session. Okay, so I, I assume that that was covered in sort of perpetuity, but let me remind you of just a couple of things. In the energy sector, which is the major dominant emissions sector for CO2, okay, if you go to the EIA, uh, hopefully you guys use EIA data, it's great, it's pretty reliable, it's, it's kind of the best we've got, uh, it does have its issues, but it's great. Uh, 2017, CO2 emissions decreased by 0.9% here in the U.S. It's actually kind of surprising, right? Everybody thinks everything goes up. But that's just related to the energy sector, okay? When you parse out CO2 emissions, and you're thinking about policy, we look at four sectors. Do you guys know what the four sectors are? Anybody? Transport. You got transport, what else? Agriculture. You got industry, okay? You've got the commercial side, you've got various sectors. So, so if you're looking at the EIA, what you guys need to know, because this is important for how you set policy, Transportation, industrial, residential, and commercial, okay? And when you parse those out, what we always focus on is which sector? Industry, okay? So that's the carbon capture side, all right? All right, the industry side is also the side that works in the subsurface. So as of right now, we basically have projects that are ongoing on a more commercial basis for enhanced oil field recovery. Is that a term you're familiar with? Okay, so I assume, Sally, you're going to talk about that a lot, right? A little bit? Okay, so, so up front, the issue with something like EOR is we do that in existing oil fields, all right? So if you look at the scale, I could throw out a bunch of numbers right now, but I'd rather you just go to the EIA and look at those yourself, because I might not remember them correctly. So, so when you look at the scale of how much is emitted in the U.S., there is definitely not a one-for-one -one volume of existing oil and gas reservoirs in the U.S. that could actually hold all of the CO2 that we produce in the United States, okay? But just remember, some of the CO2 we can use for other uses, and hopefully we'll have someone that talks about that. Okay, great. So I'm going to focus on, on the other parts of that. So that's a problem. So if we thought we were going to lock up all of the CO2 that we capture in the ground, just in oil and gas reservoirs, we're not really able to do that. They're not all suitable, okay? Geology is not a one-size-fits-all, right? So, so you can remember that going back to your your class that you had in college, that you look at one sandstone, you look at another, they look totally different, and someone will interpret them two different ways, okay? So, so we have to be careful about where, where, how we're thinking about this from a policy perspective. You can mandate all the EOR that you want, but we're not going to put it all in those places. So where else can we put them? Do you guys have any ideas? Do you guys have any background at, at all on this? If it's not in one of the gas reservoirs, where else can we put it? In the same information. Okay, what he is referring to, he's actually kind of a ringer in the problem, so okay, <laughs> so we'll correct that. But saline reservoirs are ones that are not storing oil and gas, they're, they're a, a briny aquifer, they're usually pretty deep, and we don't use them for a whole lot of purposes, why? Because they're kind of dirty and briny and hard to clean up. As it turns out, there's a lot of brine and a lot of saline aquifers, both onshore and offshore, uh, with, the, with the continental United States. And so there are places that we can store things. The science behind those two things are actually very different in terms of how we look at permanence and whether it moves underground, okay? So, I want you to leave at the end of all this knowing it's not one place that's all on policy. So what you do in this area has to be very thoughtful and thinking about a lot of key items that you're going to hear about today, but it's very important. So, 
Within the oil and gas sector, since that's where we start with the conversation, there is already existing oil and gas law, okay? And a lot of what we're doing was with the 45p tax credit, which means you get a certain percentage or a certain cents per dollar. I don't actually remember what it is anymore. I think it's different from when we first worked on it. So um, so you, you get an incentive to store it in the oil and gas field. Why does this work, okay? So here's a fact you can actually write down. Uh, so when we think about recovering oil and gas, I think everybody thinks that you get every last drop out of the ground. We don't. We don't even come close. Do you guys have anybody in the audience have any idea and want to be brave and guess how much we recover in a first run from a reservoir? A quarter. Like 25%? Mm -hmm. It's not bad. Okay, that's a pretty good estimate. Sometimes it's 10%, sometimes occasionally 35%. There's a good size range. As we get better and better at extractive techniques for oil and gas, that number goes up. So by and large, really awesome recovery is about 40%. You can use something like CO2 to get more oil and gas out of the ground. Okay? What happens is that when it comes behind in the reservoir, much of it stays behind. And that's why we know it can stay in the reservoir. Think about it. If you have stored oil and gas in a reservoir for literally millions of years, you can also store CO2. Okay? So that's kind of a lot of the background and a primer. And I'm hoping that Sally's going to get into some of those. Oh, there you are covering it. Okay, her <laughs> bad. She does it every day. All right. So, so that's some of that background. With saline formations, it's different, okay? and I hope that you can definitely speak to that. All right. So, the rules that govern the subsurface, right? It's not one agency. So, if, so this I think maybe other people aren't going to talk about. So, from a policy perspective, the burdens on you as policymakers and, and people who represent your boss, the policymakers is that you think responsibly about how you, how you look at various policies. Do you guys have any idea about how many different agencies govern the subservice? 16. It's a couple dozen, actually. Okay, when it's all said and done, if you look at the Department of the Interior alone, they have about 13 agencies. And of that, depending on where you're going to get a permit and what you're going to do in the grant, you might have to go to six or seven different agencies. You're not done there. You've also then got to go over to the EPA, or if they see primacy to the states, you're going to have to go and work with states. It might not be one office there. So all in all, there's a lot of different policy that exists out there. So another note of caution is, think really, really closely. You work with the stakeholders that came here to put this briefing on because they're very familiar <coughs> with the policies that are on the books for regulating this space. Okay. So, so a couple of quick takeaways, and then I'll be done because I know that we're short on time today, okay? The Earth itself is a whole system, just like regulatory policy, right? If you tweak one part of the system, you're going to have unintended consequences in another part of the system, okay? So right now, the urgency behind mitigating climate changes, okay, it's not even just in the CO2 space. People confuse the concept of climate change with weather, okay? I have for you guys outside, you can pick it up, is a document that I find very, very useful. My organization has 52 other professional organizations in its realm. We represent about a quarter of a million professional earth and space scientists. Okay, In here, you're going to see a lot of different policy things that actually all get back to carbon sequestration, <coughs> kind of overtly. Uh, but one piece in here is a section on climate change. And so, so I want to I wanna read something here. The Earth's climate is long-term seasonal averages of weather, okay? It's not day-to-day -day weather, so just keep that in mind. So right now, as we look at the bigger climate system, if we treat one part of it by changing emissions in one area, you may have an unintended consequence in another. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. But it just means before we think about injecting, say, aerosols into the environment to change the reflectivity and the temperature of the Earth, right? We ought to think about how that's going to impact something else. I will give you an example. What we study holistically as geologists is not all underground, okay? So how you move things in the underground impacts other parts of the underground just like above the ground, okay? So in terms of local climate, everybody knows we had a big drought that happened in the West, right? That's familiar? Please nod so you wake up. Yes, okay. Yeah. All right, you got, you got like an hour to go here. So, <laughs> so, so hang tight. So when you have drought, vegetation dries up, and then it leaves the, the Earth's surface vulnerable, okay? What happens then? Maybe you have a different rain system that happens, and all of a sudden you're flooded. What happens when you flood a dry area? Any guesses? Landslides. Landslides, 
Okay? So now you've got landslides, wildfires, okay, because you've reduced the vegetation, and that, that creates a second and third order system. Similar things happen in the ground. Okay? So as you're thinking today, I hope that you leave with a, a really deep respect of what we're talking about when we talk about putting things in the ground and mitigated carbon. Whatever you do in policy here in the United States with respect to this has world order effects. It's a very important topic and it's very important work. <coughs> Okay, a couple, couple things here. There are some studies you should make note of and bring them. You can find them online. The National Academy of Engineers, they have a study that talks about carbon storage. It's listed as one of their 13 or 14 grand challenges of our century. Okay, that's, that's kind of tall order. It's on, on par with safe global drinking water. Okay, so it's a pretty big deal. Another thing, or if you're familiar with the X Prize, they have a carbon prize. They have a lot of resources that you can go to on their website. You can also call a former Hill fellow. His name is Marcus Exterborg. He runs that program. He'll talk to you anytime. If anyone's ever heard of him, he's a great guy. He also worked on the committee, and Chairman probably met him as well. The last thing is the National Petroleum Council. Hopefully everybody knows of this entity. Uh, we are currently undertaking, and Sally's a part of that, a study <coughs> on carbon capture utilization and storage or sequestration. Okay, so those are coming. The, the, the MPC study is coming out later this year. Later this year. Yeah, because we're actively working and writing and editing that right now. So there is a host of things, okay? So consider what you're doing as very important. If you need help, my institute and the people that you're going to hear from are here to help. Pick this up as you walk out. We also have another document that I would love to share with you online. It's called Petroleum and the Environment. We have a section that relates specifically to enhanced oil recovery in there that will talk about the environmental impacts of that. All right? So a lot of the people in the room might think uh, carbon sequestration is scary. You can, you can just internally nod if that's how you feel. You can do this safely. You can do it safely. It's about picking the right place with the right policies and being very diligent about it. But if you need some, some backgrounders on that, we have that. You can find it at our website, Petroleum and the Environment. You just Google that title our document will come up and it's a resource to you, okay? So feel empowered, but be careful in this space because what you're going to do is going to have lasting effects for millennia, all right? Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Great to have you involved. Um, now I get to introduce the next speaker who is, uh, has already been suggested by Allison. Uh, a foremost expert on geologic storage of CO2. She also engages <coughs> with stakeholders and policymakers all over the United States and even internationally. Um, she is the Associate Director of the Illinois State Geological Survey, but clearly has a national role in this field. Also, um, there's been some talk already about saline storage. She's very involved. Archer, Daniel, Archer Daniels Midland is here in the room. They have the, the first large-scale storage project using CO2 from ethanol, storing over a million tons of CO2 in saline formation near Decatur, Illinois, right now, and, and Sally was very involved with the ADM team in, in developing that project. So, Sally, great to have you. Uh, please welcome Sally Greenberg. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Allison, um, for the uh, <clears throat> for the for the wonderful wonderful introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you and uh, to have an opportunity to talk a little bit of geology, um, which is what I've been asked to do. I'll try to keep it light and friendly, um, but it's um, it's always uh, it's always a challenge when you ask a geologist to talk about something that they love because they can't <laughs> stop talking about it. So. Um, uh, but um, I, I, uh, I, I tried to make it as palatable as possible. Um, as uh, Brad uh, mentioned, I'm the Associate Director of Energy and Minerals at the Illinois State Geological Survey. He gave me a bit of a promotion, um, so I'm not actually the Associate Director of the Geological Survey. Um, but I have been working in the space of carbon capture and storage for 15 years when I first met Allison and Shannon and many of uh, uh, you uh, uh, others in the room. Um, and lead a deep saline storage project in Decatur, Illinois, in conjunction with ADM, um, which has led to, from first of a um, demonstration project funded by the Department of Energy to a commercial project, which is led uh, by ADM. 
So what I'm gonna, but what I'm here to talk to you about today is car the carbon storage piece of carbon capture. So we, we talk about carbon capture, but um, I want you to, to remember that a portion of that system happens underground, like Allison mentioned. And so what, what I hope you walk away with um, today is what is carbon storage, where can we do it, how much can we do, how does it actually happen, and is it safe? And, um, uh, and so just a, you know, just a, the headline is, yes, it's safe, we know how to do it, as Allison mentioned, and we have many examples of that around the United States. Um, so the basic system of carbon capture, utilization, and storage is that you are capturing carbon dioxide from a point source. Um, in the case of the project that I lead, that point source is ethanol production, so it's essentially pure CO2 which you dehydrate. Uh, carbon dioxide is a compressible gas, which means that you can squeeze it to make it something other than, than the gas that it is um, at the surface. So when you squeeze it, it essentially becomes a liquid, and you store that carbon dioxide as a liquid deep in the, in the subsurface. You need to transport it, usually via a pipeline, and then you drill a well, a deep well, and you inject that carbon dioxide in a well-constructed steel encased system where the carbon dioxide goes directly from that um, pipe into a rock where it's stored. And we'll talk a, a, a lot more about that actual process. And then you use a variety of tools and technologies to monitor and verify that the carbon dioxide that you have put deep in the subsurface it's staying there and it's, you know where it is and it's behaving in the way that you anticipate that it will behave. So there are a variety of ways that you can store or sequester um, carbon dioxide. You can do terrestrial sequestration. Um, we have in the past talked about ocean sequestration. It's not a particularly popular idea, and I'm not going to say anything more about it than that. Um, but really, um, where, where many of us have focused over the last 20 years, especially through um, work done by the Department of Energy, is in the area of geologic storage of carbon dioxide um, in three different forms. Enhancing the recovery of methane from coal beds, enhancing oil recovery, which Allison talked a little bit about a minute ago, and then saline reservoir storage. And so um, those different mechanisms are the way in which we can utilize the earth and its potential to store things permanently um, at the, for long-term um, objective of reducing the amount of CO2 emissions going into the atmosphere. So, this figure is showing you, so I'm going to move, move on to sort of where can we do carbon storage and how much carbon storage can we do. Um, if you look at the figure on the left, you'll see a lot of areas in blue. Those are, this data comes from the Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnerships. Where they have a national atlas, which is a, an excellent resource available uh, online. Those are what are considered to be saline reservoirs or areas, sedimentary basins, where you have the potential to do large volume storage of carbon dioxide. By contrast, and Allison mentioned this when she was talking about enhanced oil recovery and how many oil, what the capacity of oil fields is to hold CO2, are, is the areas shown in red. In, on the figure in the middle. So you can see volumetrically, we have the potential to store a significant more amount of carbon dioxide in saline reservoirs associated with sedimentary basins that are not necessarily associated with the production of oil and gas. Um, there are numbers on this slide. Deepika is going to talk about numbers from the International Energy Agency in her presentation. I don't want you to get overly focused on what those numbers are. There's still a lot of work happening in this space about what is our storage capacity, how much can we store, and, and, um, and, and what models are we using to determine that. But what I do want you to take away from this slide is that when you look at the potential for storage in saline reservoirs, it is in the, in the, on the order of thousands of billions of tons. 
gigatons worth of storage of, of CO2. So the basic principles of geologic storage are that you have the earth, which is comprised of rock layers and soil layers, um, which are relatively solid from the surface to um, the place where rock is not solid. Um, and, in, and the earth stores water, fresh water, salty water, oil, natural gas, in spaces, in rocks, um, and what carbon storage is doing is using that same trapping mechanism, or permanence, um, if you will, to store carbon dioxide in the place where the Earth is already storing it. And um, what we have is porous rocks, like a sandstone, that acts as a sink or as a place where you put something. And then you have impermeable or dense rocks that act as a barrier or a lid to keep that carbon dioxide from moving, migrating upward. That's important because carbon dioxide in a um, dense liquid phase is less dense than water. So it could migrate upward. And you have put a lot of time and energy into keeping it stored in the place where you put it. So you want to make sure that it stays dead. So having that impermeable layer as a barrier to upward migration is a significant component of carbon storage. These other figures are here to, I use the word sedimentary basin, just to give you an example of what that looks like. So this is the Illinois basin. It underlies Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky, the entire three-state area. It has a, 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 a um, aerial extent, if you look at, at a map, of about 60,000 square miles. So you're talking about a significant amount of um, storage capacity. And that pink or the yellow layer at the bottom is really, is really where we have been storing um, carbon dioxide. So here are the key geologic concepts that I want you to walk away with. This is the <coughs> most sciency we're going to get <laughs> in this presentation, except I do have some pictures of rock. Um, and so, um, and, and, uh, and, but really, it all kind of boils down to this. Injectivity, so can you put carbon dioxide in a rock? Capacity, how much carbon dioxide can you put in that rock? Containment, can you keep it there and not have it move or migrate? And production, of, is there some usable commodity that you can get from the rock? And, and this, again, Allison set things up so nicely for me um, that, that um, to, to uh, talking about the oil and gas environment. So the other concepts on here have to do with, they're the underlying components of all of the four of these things, injectivity, capacity, containment, and production. So one is porosity. Porosity is the amount of open space available in a rock. So I like to think about it this way. If you had a crate of oranges, all of those oranges touch each other in multiple locations, but there's lots of space that where there's air, right? So deep in the subsurface, that space is called pore space, and it's filled with water. In the case of a saline reservoir, it's filled with super, super salty water on the order of, you know, three times, six times, ten times saltier than the ocean. That's the kind of density of, of mineral that we're talking about in that water. So how much pore space is porosity, and then permeability is how interconnected is that pore space. So in other words, can something move through the pore space? Because Swiss cheese has a high degree of porosity, but you can't move anything through Swiss cheese. Right, whereas a sponge has a high degree of porosity and permeability because water can move through those spaces because they're connected to each other. Then the other set, um, and I'm going to change this slide to permanent because I like I like that phrase, is trapping. So the earth traps things. It traps it, uh, it traps oil and gas structurally by changes in the way that the rock, maybe the rock bends and there's a trap, or there's a fault and something gets trapped. 
And then there is what we call residual trapping, and that's this picture here. And that is that when you put carbon dioxide into those pore spaces where the liquid CO2 dissolves into the brine and it moves, some of that CO2 stays behind connected to the pore spaces, connected to the rock. And over the long term, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, that carbon dioxide turns into mineral in the subsurface. So it adds coating, it adds cement to the, to the rock formation. So what does that look like? So here's some pictures of core samples from the Illinois Basin Decatur project at, at ADM's facility in Decatur. Here, these are different sandstones. The picture in the middle is what's called a photomicrograph. So that's a picture of a, of a um, very thin slice of a piece of rock magnified many, many times so that you can see the individual grains of sand. All of that blue space that you see is pore space. So that's available for the storage of water and um, carbon dioxide. And then the black and white photograph is an even more magnified example of what that pore space looks like where you can see mineral has been um, dissolved away and that's what creates the pore space. That's only there because it's because of the cool factor. <laughs> because I knew Alice would be. <laughs> um, I should have brought some rocks. Yeah, I was actually going to bring rocks, but I was worried about coming through security because they don't like rocks that look like C4. So it's kind of a <laughs> So, um, and then by contrast, the seal or the rock that is usually a shale or something um, of that density that is the, the cap rock or the, the um, confining layer is much, much denser. It's made of pieces of clay that accumulate like muck at the bottom of a pond that turns into rock. And you can see in the, in the um, scanning electron micrograph in the middle that there's, there's zero pore space. So what it does is if you have CO2 stored here, then that impermeable rock acts as a, as a, as I have said several times now, as an upward um, barrier, mi a migration barrier. I only have a couple more slides, so now I want to move to, to safety and what we do once we have CO2 stored in the ground. This is a whole laundry list of different types of monitoring technology. We monitor the atmosphere, we monitor the soil, we monitor the groundwater in the shallow locations, you know, 50 feet beneath the ground where maybe you have a well or 400 feet, um, all the way down to 6,800 feet where we have CO2 storage indicator, for example. We use geophysical monitoring techniques where you see trucks like up, this up above, which have a plate on them, and that plate sends energy into the earth, and then we record how long it takes for that energy to bounce back. It's essentially like taking a sonogram of the Earth, and you end up with an image that looks like this on the bottom. Here. And then if you repeat that over time, once you have carbon dioxide stored in, in your rock layers, you can start to see a difference in the reflection in those different layers, and that's where your carbon dioxide is stored. So this is an example from the um, Sleipner project in uh, um, Norway, uh, which is under CO2 stored under the North Sea. So we spend, as scientists, an enormous amount of time understanding the environment before we put carbon dioxide <coughs> into it, while we're storing carbon dioxide, and then monitoring after the fact. And that's a, a word, uh, the phrase that we use for that is establishing a baseline. So, because the complicated thing here is that in the air, in the soil, in the shallow groundwater, in the deep brine that I'm talking about, in the rock itself, all of those things already have carbon dioxide in them. So you have to know what your carbon dioxide is that you're storing and how it's different. So you have to understand the system the natural variation in your system to, to understand whether or not you have an anomalous result as a function of your stored carbon dioxide. And trust me, 
a lot of time and energy and funding goes into understanding what the best mechanisms are for being able to store this. Because when you store carbon dioxide, you have to demonstrate to the Environmental Protection Agency and a whole lot of dozens of agencies, as Allison was talking about, that you are not going to damage underground sources of drinking water and that what you're doing is not going to fracture the rock into which you are injecting. So this is completely opposite of hydraulic fracturing, where the point of hydraulic fracturing is to make microfractures so that you can extract more oil or natural gas from, from those, those resources. Here, we are regulated by law to understand what the pressure is that would break the rock, and you can only inject at a pressure that is 80% of what that fracture pressure is, is called. So you, if you break the rock, you're in big trouble, basically, is what it comes down to. Um, the other thing is that we use a lot of sophisticated modeling. We collect a lot of data in our, um, when we drill wells, when we do seismic surveys, and so scientists, geologists especially, love rocks, they love data, we put all of that into models to help us understand and image what the CO2 looks like and where it is in the subsurface. And so this is um, from the two projects that we have in Decatur and the two plumes um, from those two different projects. Anthony, I don't know if you've seen that, but anyway. Um, and then, so, the, my sort of takeaway points are, I, I want you to understand that Carbon capture utilization and storage is comprised of a bunch of pre-existing technologies that are not new and are not unique. What is unique is the combination of those technologies to solve an immediate problem. And that is where policy helps us um, and, and why, the, why we're even considering doing CCUS. I also want you to understand that the United States is leading in both saline and enhanced oil recovery storage in protection of the of state water, um, of, of state drinking water, in uh, policy incentives like 45Q. What you need to be able to do this is you have to choose the best geology available. And so as Allison said, the geology is always going to be different. You always, always, always have to understand what that is when it comes to storage. There is no, um, there's, there's no way of getting around bad geology, <laughs> and there's only certain places that you can do that. And, um, and but we know where those are, and we understand what it means. Um, forming good partnerships is super important. That includes partnerships between those of you in this room and those of us who are doing this as scientists. And so I would encourage you, my information is, is in this presentation, to reach out to me or any of my colleagues to utilize the resources that Allison has mentioned um, and to leverage the, the, the knowledge that exists from 20 years of, of doing this. Um, and engagement is super, super critical at all levels, at the policy level, at the general public, and at the project level. And then, at, here's my contact information. I need to do a little bit of setup for um, Deepika because she is going to be talking about enhanced oil recovery. And so what I just want to do here is show you this slide. So enhanced oil recovery uses all of those geologic principles that I talked about. Trapping, permanence, um, oil is trapped in the ground, it's held in pore spaces. And what you do with enhanced oil recovery is you use carbon dioxide. You can either use it as a pushing force or you can use it as a solvent, where depending on the pressure and temperature of your reservoir, if you have the right conditions, you can get the CO2 to go into essentially solution with the oil and it makes it less sticky. And then when you pump on it, you can produce more oil. So that's the basic, um, uh, basic of uh, enhanced oil recovery. Or if you don't have quite those right pressure and temperature conditions, you can use it as a pushing force, uh, which helps you move CO2 from well to well where it's produced. So I've taken quite a lot of time, and uh, but thank you all very much.
Thank you, Sally. Um, so as, as Sally just said, we're shifting gears now to enhanced oil recovery, but one thing before I introduce Deepika, I just want to emphasize, because this is a, often a big misunderstanding, the 45T tax credit is not an incentive for enhanced oil recovery. It is an incentive for geologic storage of CO2. You've heard about the pathway of storing CO2 in saline formation. Another pathway for which you can claim the credit is to store that CO2 through the process of enhanced oil recovery. And so Deepak is going to talk about that process and the net carbon reduction benefits that come from that. So Deepika uh, is with the Clean Air Task Force. She is deeply involved in all aspects of policy development and modeling around carbon capture, utilization, and storage. She's at the federal level. She's also very active in the state of California and been involved in the recent rulemaking where California is integrating carbon capture and storage uh, into their client state climate policy. So we're very lucky to have Deepika here. And I'll turn it over to you, Deepika. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about enhanced oil recovery. I'm going to repeat, as Allison said, as Sally said a million times, so, which is actually a good thing in my presentation, uh, so please bear with me. Um, I'll start with, as Sally said, um, enhanced oil recovery is one of the mechanisms through which um, CO2 can be geologically trapped. So I know that she mentioned uh, that you can use CO2 at supercritical pressures to push oil out that is hard to get in the first time. As Allison mentioned, you only get 10% in the first go. You, you you do a second go with steam, or you and then you do a third go with, with CO2 at supercritical pressures. You can push CO, uh, oil out, um, and uh, in that process, the CO2 gets trapped in those pores. So not all of the CO2 uh, is, is sort of dissolves into oil to make it uh, less viscous. So uh, maybe some CO2 does, but when it is produced from the production oil, uh, production well, it comes. It, this uh, the, there is a separation process through which CO2 is separated and then set back down in the closed loop process. So once CO2 has been injected for enhanced oil recovery purposes, it is trapped in in that whole process because it, even though some comes back out, it's put back in right away. So that's a trapping mechanism. And today my presentation is going to focus on, um, I'm, I'm going to try and paint a picture of the role for enhanced oil recovery in, in addressing climate change and the importance of it. So uh, you, you'll take away where it fits in the whole solution. Um, I have to start with the IPCC. The 1.5 degree report was released last year. Um, all of the scenarios that they run uh, that that need uh, that that would enable us to limit temperature rise to under 1.5 degrees scenario uh, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, require us to reach zero emissions by the middle of the century. So around 2060 or 2070, that's like the latest by when we need to hit zero emissions, and beyond that, we need to go to negative emissions. They highlighted four scenarios in the report. Three of those four scenarios used uh, among many solutions, CCUS, uh, and CCUS provides a, a large share of the uh, service in, in help helping us get to that zero emissions and then further down negative emissions. There's one scenario that the report highlighted that doesn't use CCUS um, at all, and that happens to be the re uh, scenario in which globally we cut our energy use by a third. Um, just a just, uh, perspective on that. That seems to be a slightly risky bet to not to to, to not have a technology that could store up close to a trillion tons of CO2 cumulatively to address climate change. To not have a technology, to not invest in that technology today is a risky bet because that would mean that we would have to cut our energy use by a third, which is probably not um, easy. So, uh, in terms of the role for enhanced oil recovery in, in that picture, in, uh, in terms of use of CCUS in meeting the climate targets, the need is, uh, between the three scenarios that do use CCUS, we see a range of 350 billion metric tons being stored to 1.2 trillion metric tons being stored cumulatively across the world. Capacity, Sally already mentioned this. We have a whole bunch of capacity to store that CO2. Uh, we have a, we have 10 trillion tons in saline uh, formations, and slightly less, relatively speaking, uh, in, in enhanced oil recovery uh, storage, which is 140 billion tons of CO2 globally. Um, 
while EOR looks to be a smaller number relative to um, saline sequestration, it has a very important role to play. And that important role comes from the fact that it provides an economic driver today. Um, 45Q was mentioned, 45Q provides $50 a ton for saline sequestration and $35 a ton, uh, a metric ton, for uh, utilization and one of the forms of utilization is enhanced oil recovery. Um, although $35 looks a little less than $50, uh, the truth is that there is uh, an additional revenue that can be earned by captures if they store, if they choose to store their CO2 in enhanced, through enhanced oil recovery. And the reason for that is because the enhanced oil in, uh, recovery industry would pay to take that CO2 because it is of economic value to them, because they can produce oil through it. So the, the difference between $35 and $50 of a federal tax credit is made up, or sometimes more than made up, by the uh, value that the oil industry would place on that CO2. So whoever is doing carbon capture and then storing CO2 through enhanced oil recovery would would one get ben get the benefit of the $35 a ton tax credit plus the revenue. And in several situations, that total happens to uh, be more economical uh, than uh, doing saline sequestration. So we're going to see that that additional economic opportunity will, 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 will drive CCUS in the near future. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide. Sally mentioned this, Ali, uh, Alison mentioned this. Um, it's just a graphical representation of the three things. There's nature, that is geology. There's um, the 15 agencies with regulations in the gray box and industry experience. And industry, and the thing I want to say about industry experience is that um, since CO2 is purchased and it has value, the uh, industry best practices would ensure that it wouldn't leak or you wouldn't fracture the, the rock and let the CO2 go because it's of value or you now lose your permit to, uh, to, to actually store. So the industry best practices would also play a role in ensuring the permanence of CO2 underground. Um, another thing that I want to talk about EOR is that it's not just uh, you're, you're not just storing CO2 underground and then making oil that also produces more uh, CO2 in the end. So it's it's not sort of a lost cause from a climate perspective. Their enhanced oil recovery actually re reduces emissions, even though there might be emissions attached to the process. And this is a graphical representation of uh, an al the, the most comprehensive study done on life cycle emissions from enhanced oil recovery, which was done by the International Energy Agency in 2015. There's a link uh, that I've provided there, so if you look at these slides, you can look at the report directly. But this is just a summary of it. And I wish I could move, uh, I, if I'm loud enough, I, I just, I just want to use my hand here. Um, this is a decrease, light green is a decrease, which means it's the injection. So let's say we start with a ton of CO2 that is injected into an oil field to do enhanced oil recovery. You probably don't, that's not all of the emissions reduction because you have to account for some emissions increases in the, in the life cycle of that, of that process. Relative to traditional oil production, enhanced oil recovery has additional processes that involve recycling of CO2. Uh, um, so there is some energy use that is associated with it that is relatively more than what is uh, used in a traditional oil production. So you need to account for emissions from that energy use, so you add back some. <coughs> when you produce oil through EOR and it hits the market, um, it's not all of it is new oil production or not all of it is new oil consumption. Some of it is new, some of it is not. The IEA finds that about 80, it's like an 80-20 split, about 84% of um, all oil that is produced by EOR displaces existing supply. And um, so the remaining, which is 16%, becomes additional consumption because you're increasing supply, so the price goes down, so the demand goes up. So more people are driving farther away and, and um, maybe taking more vacations, so we got more, we have more emissions. So this is from the uh, this is emissions from the oil that, that we didn't displace, and this is emissions from the oil that is additionally consumed. When you add all of this up, uh, that kind of reduces the effect on a net basis of that one ton that is injected, and so you land up with a net of um, 0.63 tons, uh, and if you look at it on a percentage basis, for whatever amount you put underground through enhanced oil recovery, 63% of that volume 
can be considered net reduction. Now, this is sort of like the middle scenario um, that, that the IEA highlights. There are variations you need to consider, things like displacement. If the, what if the displacement is less? What if uh, you don't displace 80% of existing supply? What if you displace less? That means you have more additional oil. The IA uh, estimates that even if the additional oil goes from 16 to 50%, you will still see net, redu net reductions. The other thing to keep in mind is the IA assumes in all of this, this calculation an equivalent kind of oil being replaced or displaced. But that's not probably how it works in the real market. So um, likely that uh, the oil that you will displace is more carbon intensive than the oil that you have now produced through POR. And if that happens, you're, you're probably going to see higher net negative emissions or uh, even uh, net reductions, I'm sorry, or even net negative emissions. That means that you may actually be storing more than you release because of that displacement. Um, the other thing I want to talk about EOR is that it acts as a stepping stone towards wide scale saving sequestration. We, we already know, Ali mentioned, and, uh, Alison mentioned, and Sally mentioned this, that there is less EOR available than uh, there is storage capacity for saving in saving formations. But to get to that point where we do wide scale saving sequestration, EOR will play a really important role because of that economic driver that I just mentioned. Um, so it, it, it's a matter of you know diff uh, EOR because of that additional revenue that it can provide, um, an additional economic opportunity that it can provide will likely drive more CCS projects, meaning that we will we will deploy and learn from doing, uh, and and maybe it will result in cost reductions from for capture technology, for transportation, and for storage. And the other thing to, to and, and that'll make saline sequestration more affordable. Um, relatively more affordable. And the other thing to note about EOR is that if EOR industry helps develop capture, um, de helps deploy capture and develop pipeline systems for transporting CO2 from source to sink, um, the same infrastructure could actually be repurposed for saline sequestration. And I have like a diagram to show you what that looks like. Um, those are the sandstone and shale layers that uh, Sally mentioned. So the brown is all the sandstone that holds, you know, water in the top layer. Then there's the yellow, which is the oil. Then the white, which is the CO2, which is going into saline, uh, saline formations. You can see how they're like stacked up. So if a pipeline is bringing from, say, ethanol production in the Midwest down to all the all the places where there is EOR, which is in the green. The saline formations are right underneath or above the uh, same area. So the pipelines that would transmit large volumes of CO2 from large sources to you know large sink can still be used when we move from EOR to saline. So it's almost like the private capital would have been utilized to develop that infrastructure that will then be used in the future for saline sequestration. So this is an example of how stack storage can can then you know can utilize existing infrastructure. So in this way, saline form saline storage becomes more lucrative in, in as we uh, as we deploy this, this infrastructure. The last thing I want to say is that e EOR is not some static process. It is uh, it is something that is likely to evolve, and uh, there is room for innovation. And right now. Although EOR industry would, would like to use as little CO2 as possible to get as much oil out as possible, um, there is a role for public policy um, to design uh, to be designed in such a way that it can incentivize the industry to use more CO2 to produce less oil, and that, that, that ratio to sort of play with that ratio, um, and that can increase either the net emission reduction or uh, create net neg negative emissions in the end. So key takeaways: um, CCUS is important. It's secure, it has net reductions, um, and it will lead the way uh, by infrastructure development for saving, wide scale saving infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepika. <coughs> Our uh, next speaker is Jesse Stolark with Third Way. Uh, Jesse recently joined Third Way. She was with the Energy and Environmental Study Institute. Some of you may know her in that role. She uh, was policy advisor working on uh, energy and agricultural programs for ESI. ESI. Uh, she's now at Third Way leading their efforts on carbon capture and utilization and very active in all the federal policy work going on. It's great to have her in this role. 
and Jesse's going to talk to you about other beneficial ways to do it, use CO2 beyond enhanced soil recovery that will result in emissions reductions. And she's going to talk a little bit about direct air capture, capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. So please welcome Jesse. And thank you all for being here on this beautiful day during recess. Um, as, as Brad said, I'm Jesse Stoller, and I just recently joined Third Way with at EDSI, and this is an issue kind of near and dear to my heart because at EDSI I worked on a lot of biofuels, bioeconomy, uh, biotechnology issues, and I actually have a master's degree in geology, so I like to tell people I'm a recovering geologist. Um, so. Right up front, I just want to tell you my three takeaways from the presentation since we've been sitting for a long time today. And it's really going to echo what all, all the previous speakers have said. You know, these technologies are going to be necessary for climate change. They exist already. They are not a fantasy. Um, but they are going to need additional policy support if we're going to see them at the scope and the scale that's required for climate change. And I just wanted to kind of, you know, when they asked me to talk about direct air capture and utilization all together in 10 minutes, I mean, we could spend, we could spend weeks on these technologies, but why we're talking about the two of them together is they really go hand in hand. In terms of the scope of the issue, direct air capture is really needed to capture or capture and storage of CO2, but utilization is going to be really important because it's going to provide economic uh, commodities that we can basically commoditize CO2. We look at CO2 as a waste product, but really we can look at it as a commodity. We also throw around this term zero carbon or carbon free. There's a lot of things that we really re rely upon in our modern economy that are uh, based, based on carbon, like our water bottles that we're drinking out of today, the carpet that we're standing on, a lot of the clothes we're wearing, transportation fuels, computers, electronics. There's just so many things that we're not going to find replacements to carbon in our lives. And so we have to think of, instead about where is that carbon coming from? Is there a, a way to recycle carbon or to permanently sequester carbon in products that we're using in our everyday lives? So I wanted to kind of take a historical aside. Like Sally said, these technologies are in existence. The really cool thing to me about carbon dioxide removal technologies is they've been around a long time. They're actually what have enabled us to go into space. They're what enabled us to uh, exist in like submarines and enclosed environments. And I actually wrote this book even before I started working on carbon dioxide and, and CPR. And it's a really cool book. It's, it's by Scott Kelly. He's the uh, astronaut who spent a year at, at the International Space Station and they're doing a twin study on him because his brother is actually an astronaut as well. But he spent a lot of the book talking about how frustrating their carbon dioxide removal system was to him and how it's a major impediment for us to get into Mars. And so really the only difference between what he's talking about in that book and what we're talking about today, again, is the scope and the scale. It's really kind of a similar technology. So. Why is Third Way working on carbon capture? I just wanted to kind of briefly uh, tell you why. So we have a couple of high-level um, goals that we want to see in any U.S. climate policy. The first is that it's zero by 50, meaning zero net emissions by 2050, because the science is very clear on that that's where we need to be. The second is that a new policy is innovation forward, and we feel that we really need to ramp up very quickly both the scope and the scale of innovation funding both at the federal level and in, in private industry. And then the third is that it's technology inclusive, I think, as others have mentioned today. You know, we're not going to get there with just zero emissions technologies. We need to utilize all of the technologies on the table. We can't take anything off the table. I think, you know, we can we can debate what, what the role of renewable technologies are, but I think we you know we're really handicapping ourselves if we if we take anything off the table. So you know, why carbon capture in terms of dealing with climate change and, and director capture specifically? Um, Senator King got to this issue, I think, really well. He was at, a, at an energy hearing a couple weeks ago, and he showed this graph that just shows over almost the last million years where CO2 levels have been. And if you look at that spike at the very, very end there, that's really since the Industrial Revolution, how much uh, CO2 we've been putting into the atmosphere. And he was trying to make the point that even if we got to zero emissions tomorrow, we also have to deal with what's already in the atmosphere. And that I, at that hearing, they said that 95% of the problem in regards to CO2 and other greenhouse gases are already in the atmosphere. So we have to both deal with existing emission sources, but also begin drawing down what's already been in the atmosphere. And this is just a kind of a summary of the IPCC scenarios, and Deepak had talked about it, so I won't belabor the point, but if you see on the bottom here, the blue, that's really where we need to be in terms of um, net negative emissions, and we really need to be ramping up these technologies in, in the near term to kind of get to the volumes that we need to get to um, by mid-century. 
there was a recent report by the Rhodium Group, and they said that we need million, 9 million tons of direct air capture capacity by 2030 to meet our mid-century goals. So that's kind of where that you see that blue taking off in the bottom there. And, and the other point I wanted to make is that we also have all these um, emitting technologies that are going to be very hard to, hard to decarbonize that includes our industrial sector. Um, build it, the building sector is another one. And so that we need you know, to be working on multiple strategies here. So what is direct air capture? And I think Sally really outlined things really well. If you were here at the last presentation, they also gave a great, very technical expl explanation of what post-combustion capture is. And post-combustion capture is very similar to direct air capture. Um, it uses very similar technology. Uh, you use fans to suck in the ambient air. It's passed over a sorbent and solvent to collect the CO2 that is heated to um, to compress, uh, heated to shake the CO2 loose from those scrubbers, and then it is um, compressed. It can be stored, or as I was discussing before, it can be you can make useful products from it. And it's interesting to note when I say it has unlimited capture potential. With director capture, our only limitation is how many facilities we want to build and, and where we want to put them. So in terms of commercialization, there's three companies that are already kind of the commercial leaders in the space. There's Carbon Engineering from Canada, Climeworks, which is based in Switzerland, and Global Thermostat, which is here in the United States. Um, Carbon Engineering just uh, announced last week that they are partnering with Oxy Petroleum in the Permian Basin. They're going to be using director capture for enhanced oil recovery and they're planning on capturing up to a million uh, metric tons of CO2 per year at that facility. Global Thermostat is also um, building the world's largest structure capture facility in Huntsville, Alabama. So going back to carbon utilization, it's basically we're turning the carbon from a waste to a commodity. And you can think of pretty much an application in every single sector, um, from fuels to chemicals, building materials, agriculture, and then new materials. And there's a couple of different drivers for um, carbon utilization, why we're seeing companies pick up on this. One is if you can make a product that has a higher value or it's cheaper to make it with recycled carbon uh, than with the petroleum, which they're, you know, carbon fiber is a very valuable material. So that's one example. A second example would be if you can come up with a, a product that has a novel, novel properties as compared to what you could derive from petroleum products. So that might be things like ethanol because it has novel characteristics as compared to fossil, uh, gasoline. Um, and then a third driver, and that's pretty much the major drive right now, is policy, whether it's the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard or California also has a buy clean, clean standard, which is um, hopefully going to incentivize the use of things like um, building materials that have lower embodied CO2 in them. And so that you're kind of seeing those, those are the sort of the early market pull. Um, and then it's estimated that there's a one trillion U.S. global market, or U.S. market opportunity every year in carbon utilization, and it's even, you know, multiple times bigger worldwide. So again, um, these are just a few of the companies kind of commercializing the technology. Third Wave put out a map uh, last summer, looking at kind of who all the players are, and at that time there were 49 companies in the United States commercializing CO2-based products. So. I would assume that number might even be higher today. I wanted to point out one of my, per, I think, everybody in the space's favorite projects is Lanza Tech. Uh, Lanza Tech is using a process where they're capturing the waste gases from steel mills to produce a jet fuel, and they're, they've actually flown that on a commercial flight already. They're partnering with Virgin Atlantic, and Lanza Tech is commercializing that technology already in China, the UK, and the EU. And we were talking a little bit before about kind of there's all this uh, research and development happening in, at the federal level. You know, it's really amazing on direct air capture and utilization. There's just been sort of a flourishing over the last year in terms of all these reports. There's these really foundational reports from the National Academies of Sciences, the Department of Energy is looking at, at it, as well as outside groups like the Rodian Group that did this really great report on direct air capture that was just released. Um, it's very interesting to note, uh, if you look at the, I think, con you know, what we're excited about is that Congress is already acting on these recommendations. So, for example, in the National Academy of Sciences report, um, it recommends $16 million for direct air capture of uh, research and development money every year, and in the House Appropriations Bill, there was $10 million. So it's a really excellent starting point for all of this. But in general, we, you know, I think the consensus here is that we need a significant federal investment in the, our, the research and development of all these technologies. I'm not going to talk a lot about 45Q. I think everybody's done a really great job uh, talking about it, but I love this quote from Senator Heitkamp. 
um, who spoke about 45Q at an event last week, and she said the single greatest thing that 45Q did is it put carbon capture on the map. For me, what she meant is that you know 45Q is a foundational policy. It's not the only policy. Just like we saw with renewables technologies, it took a lot of different policy supports to kind of get the, those technologies over the finish line. I think the same is going to be true with carbon capture. Um, and then I'll just give a mention to the um, policy blueprint, which will be picked up a copy outside. You know, it really puts together this picture very nicely of kind of all the things that need to come together in the policy world. So that'll be a teaser. I think one of the next um, carbon capture lunch lunches is going to be on policy. So what your appetite. So if you have any questions on utilization or direct air capture, you can feel free to reach out to me. If I don't know the answer, I probably know the person who knows the answer. So thank you all. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks to everyone for great presentations. We are at the end of our scheduled time. I imagine that some of you need to leave. So what I would suggest is those who need to leave, feel free to do so. But the speakers are all here and would be happy to stay and answer questions for those who have a few more minutes and questions to ask. And I apologize that we came right up to 1 o'clock. Um, so anybody, anybody have questions for the speakers? Feel free. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, uh, it's a blue. <coughs>